This physcast will look at an example of electromagnetic induction. You should pause the video now and read through the problem carefully. Now that you've read through the problem, we can begin by interpreting what's happening in this particular situation. So we're being asked to draw some graphs of what's happening with the magnetic flux through a coil and the induced EMF that will be produced in that coil. So it should be clear that if it's magnetic flux that we're interested in, as well as an induced EMF, that we're going to be looking at a problem that involves an application of Faraday's law. Important in this problem will be to make sure we understand exactly what's going on and how we're going to approach the solution. That's in our development stage. So a diagram will prove to be very, very useful to us here. Let's begin by trying to understand the magnetic field. Let's draw it going, for example, here out of the page. So it's a uniform field, and we're told the magnitude of that field, and let's draw it as if it's coming out of the page, as indicated there, some particular magnetic field with a direction. And there's a coil that's moving into that field with a constant velocity. So that coil out here, we could imagine drawing it's a square coil, something like this moving in, except we're told, importantly here, something about the orientation of this coil, that its plane is perpendicular to the magnetic field, so I've kind of drawn it in that case, but that it's moving with its velocity parallel to its side. So in fact, I need to make sure I think of my coil as being oriented as such. And it has side lengths L, for example, here, moving with a, s a velocity V, whose value we know, uh, parallel to one of its sides. So this coil is flying into the magnetic field. At some point later, it might be within the magnetic field. And an interesting thing for us to consider is the moment at which it starts to enter that magnetic field. And I might label those three situations with the coil well outside the field. I call that situation A. The coil as it's about to enter the field, as it's just starting to enter the field B, and the situation where the coil is completely contained within the field, I might call that C. And I actually might think about labeling this time here, that's what I'm going to call time zero, just as the coil is starting to enter the field. Now, I'm going to need to consider the magnetic flux. What do I know about the magnetic flux through a coil? I know that's written as the integral of the magnetic field dotted in to the area. And as I start to calculate what this is going to be, I can use some simplifications here if my magnetic field is actually parallel to the area vector. Remember the area vector points perpendicular to the surface. Um, then this integral should be fairly easy to do. And I can consider that this flux is going to be important because later on if I want to figure out the EMF, the induced EMF in this coil, Faraday's law tells me it will be the negative of the time rate of change of the magnetic flux. So let's consider situation A here. What's the magnetic flux going to be when the coil is completely outside the field? That should be a reasonably easy one to calculate uh, because uh, B here is zero. The A won't be zero, but the integral of zero here will just give me zero. So that's a fairly easy one to do. Almost as easy to do is in situation C here where the coil is completely inside the field. Now importantly, the magnetic field in this case will be parallel to the um, direction of the area vector here. So this flux will simply be adding up B times dA over the entire area, and that would just be B, the magnitude of the field, uh, times the area. And given that this is a square of side length L, that would just be B L squared. And I know the values here. I know that L from my, from my problem here is 0 0.6 of a meter, and I know that B uh, equals 0 0.2 Tesla. So this is a fairly easy number to calculate here. This is just going to be 0 0.2 times 0 0.6 squared, uh, which will simply give me a value of 72 milliwebers, the Weber being the unit for magnetic flux. And that's a constant. That's, that's how much flux is in my coil when my coil is completely contained within the field. Now the Perhaps most interesting situation is situation B, where my coil is just starting to enter the field. And I can think about this by 
you know, at some time after time zero, there'll be some part of my coil here that has field in it and some part that does not. And I'll call, again, the side length of my coil is L, but I'll call this little distance here that's got a, a field contained with it. I'll of course call that X for the time being. And we can see that once more our magnetic flux is reasonably easy to calculate because my magnetic field is again parallel to dA and it's uniform um, throughout space here. As long as I'm inside the field, the field is uniform. So this will again just be the magnetic field times the area of the loop that that magnetic field is occupying. And in this case that won't be L squared, it's not the entire area, it will be L times x. It'll just be this little area of this section that contains the magnetic field. And that's not going to be constant, of course, because my coil is moving here. It's moving with a uniform velocity of 5 meters per second. So I can think about that my uh, x here, how much of my coil is in the field, is simply going to equal uh, v times t, because I started my time just as there was about to be field entering. So the distance this coil will have traveled will be the speed multiplied by the time. So this uh, magnetic flux in situation B will just be B L times V T. And we can kind of get some idea what's going to happen to the magnetic flux as time ticks on. We can also get some idea about what might be going to happen with the induced EMF, both of which we're going to graph in a second. Uh, what's the time scale I'm talking about here? Well, everything up to time zero will have zero flux. Uh, and at time zero, we start to increase the flux, given by the expression we found uh, over here. Uh, at what time does it go from situation B to situation C? We really just want to know how long does it take for the coil to completely enter the field. And that will just be the distance it has to travel, the side length L here, um, divided by the speed that it's traveling at. And again, these are numbers we know. 0.6 meters is the side length, 5 meters per second. And this comes out to be 0 0.12 seconds. So I think I have enough information here now to move my workspace up a little bit to actually start the evaluation step, which in this case is to draw some graphs. The first thing it wanted me to draw um, was a graph of the magnetic flux uh, as this coil moved into the, into the magnetic field. So let's imagine a graph here where we've got time along the horizontal axis, perhaps in seconds, and maybe we'll have magnetic flux here on the vertical axis. Let's do it in units of, of milliwebbers, seeing as that seems to be what's happening. And this is time zero here. And we know that up until time zero, our magnetic flux is zero. And that at some time, t equals 0.12 of a second, uh, we actually have a, uh, a value here of 72 milliwebbers at all times after that because our coil is completely in the field. And if we look at situation uh, B here, as we're going from not being in the field to heading into the field, we can see it actually varies linearly with time. This, this, um, this magnetic flux here is a linear, so it's B, L, V, they're all constants, times T. So it will just be a straight line joining along like that. So there's my graph of how I expect my magnetic flux through the coil to vary with time. and reasonably straightforwardly I can do something quite similar here for considering the induced EMF. The magnitude of that is simply the time rate of change or the gradient from this graph here. And again we can think in terms of these three situations. In situation A we want d by dt of zero. Well, it's, it's always zero so basically the gradient out here for, for negative times um, that equals zero. So my induced EMF in that section there will be will be zero. In situation B here, I want the time rate of change of this quantity here, B L V T. And again B L and V are constants, so the time derivative here is fairly easy. It's just B L times V. And once more they're numbers that I know that's 0.2 of a Tesla times 0.6 of a meter for the side length times five meters per second. And that actually comes out here to be 0.6 and this is an induced EMF I'm calculating, so that will, in SI units, be in units of volts. And in situation C, the time rate of change of the magnetic flux there, well, it's going to be the time rate of change of BL squared, or 72 milliwebbers. But again, that's a constant. 
So the time rate of change of that is zero. So my induced EMF uh, for situation C there will be zero. So just giving myself enough space to draw my second graph. I can put it under my first one here. And this is now going to be a graph of the induced EMF in volts um, versus time in seconds. And once more, the interesting point here will be what happens between t equals 0 and t equals 0.12 of a second at negative times before my coil entered the field. The induced EMF was 0. Uh, at times after the coil is completely in the field, my induced EMF is again 0. The gradient of this line is 0, but the slope of the line between t equals 0 and 0.12 seconds, time during which the coil is entering the field, um, actually is at some constant gradient, some constant slope up here, um, whose value we know will be 0.6 volts. Let's just do a quick assessment step to finish off this problem here. Does this make sense? Um, so let's just see if it's reasonable or what we like to think of as, as physical. Is this something that actually corresponds to our physical understanding of the situation? If the magnetic flux here is telling us about how many field lines are pointing through uh, a particular area, we can see outside the field at zero. When it's completely in the field, the number of field lines that point uh, into that area won't be changing. And so there's these horizontal lines on our magnetic flux graph. And as it's moving in at constant velocity in a uniform field, that should increase linearly. So our, our calculations there uh, actually confirm what we physically expect. What about the induced EMF? Remember, an induced EMF from Faraday's law has to do with the time rate of change of magnetic flux. And there's only one region where that magnetic flux is changing, and that is as the coil is entering the field. It's, it's a really important point to realize that when the coil is completely in the magnetic field, in, in region, in situation C, as I referred to it, there's a large amount of flux in the coil, but that gives us no EMF. We don't care how much flux there is. As such, we care about the rate at which that flux is changing.